Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Thank you, Dan. And as Dan said, I am Marcos Kunalakis. I'm at the Hoover Institution as a visiting fellow, and I'm delighted to be here at the Commonwealth Club to moderate this evening's program on the future of American diplomacy. And joining me on stage uh, are our special guests uh, and the authors and those who put together this uh, a, a blueprint for a more modern U.S. diplomatic service. And I'll start with to my immediate right, and this is Ambassador Mark uh, Grossman, who served as the Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, which is the State Department's third ranking official. And uh, Ambassador Grossman retired in 2005 after, two, after 29 years in the U.S. Foreign Service. Um, he, as Assistant Secretary uh, for European Affairs, uh, he helped direct NATO's military campaign in Kosovo and an earlier round of NATO expansion. And Ambassador Grossman was also the U.S. Ambassador to Turkey from 1994 through 1997. At the end of the stage is uh, our uh, fabulous retired Ambassador Marcy Rees, uh, with more than 35 years of diplomatic experience in Europe, the Caribbean, and the Middle East. She's a three-time chief of mission, serving as head of the U.S. mission in Kosovo, U.S. ambassador to Albania, and most recently as U.S. ambassador to Bulgaria. So you can tell there's a lot of firepower on this stage and f an awful lot of experience. Um, we're talking about over 60 years together. And so... Um, They've worked together, and this has been a long process, to put together this blueprint for a more modern U.S. diplomatic service. They are now at the stage where they are going to try and implement some of their uh, ideas and, uh, and these plans that have been put together through a, a series of collective individuals who also are in, uh, have worked in this field. But let's start with why even come up with a blueprint for a more modern U.S. diplomatic service. So who would like to take that? Marcus, we'll feel that. If you allow me, I'll, yes. I'll start. Marcus, first of all, thank you. And before I say anything about the blueprints, let me just thank all of you for coming out this evening to show your interest in diplomacy. I know it's been a tough weather day here, and um, we really appreciate the fact that you would come here. And um, we thank all the people who are watching online as well. And if I could just thank Dan and Carla. Uh, they've been wonderful hosts here at the Commonwealth Club this afternoon. Thank you very much for taking us in out of the weather um, and letting us uh, be here this afternoon. So, Marcus, this is, a, as you said, this is a story um, that Marcy and I have been working on for some time. And the question of why, the issue is sort of what best helps the United States of America represent itself overseas, protect and defend America's interests overseas. And we are committed to the fact that that's about diplomacy, right? And in our view, diplomacy is more important than ever. And I think you can see it all around the world. You can see it, uh, you can see it in Ukraine, which I hope we'll talk about a little bit. But you can especially see it um, here when you stand in the Pacific and look to the Indo-Pacific, and diplomacy is going to play a really important role um, in America's future uh, in the Pacific. So we thought from that beginning, which is that diplomacy is more important than ever. And the second reason why is we came to believe in all of the work that we have done that the American people expect and the American people deserve world-class best diplomacy that they can have. And so one of the things that we wanted to do was to try to just make some recommendations to people about how to move from where we are now to the best and the most well-executed diplomacy that we can find ourselves. And so we started working on this. I'll tell you a little bit more about it some years ago. Uh, but we've now come up with these blueprints, uh, and they are special, and they're unique. Um, and I'd like to tell you a little bit why that's true as well. But th the, the goal of all of this is one sentence, is that we want to make operationally significant 
difference and changes in the way that American diplomats do their work abroad. You can see from everything that we have written that we have nothing but respect and for honor for the people who are doing this work for us every single day around the world. But they need more help and they need more support and they need more education and they need lots of different things. And that's what we were trying to look at um, in these blueprints. When we started this, we sort of laid out several principles, which I think are important to understand as well. And the first principle was transparency. We wanted to be transparent in our work with the State Department, with the executive branch, with the Congress, with the currently serving, so people knew exactly what it is that we were trying to do. Second thing is we wanted to be bipartisan. And through all of this effort, as you will see in the blueprints and in everything we've said, everything we've written, we've worked with Democrats, with Republicans on Capitol Hill, around the country to try to make sure that this is a bipartisan effort. Third principle is that the State Department needs to change, right? So the title of today's talk is, you know, here's a crisis at the State Department and that the State Department needs to change and it needs to change in several different ways in order to be the best diplomacy that it can be um, around the world. And what we had to talk to people about is, is that the State Department needs to earn its way back into the center of foreign policy execution and foreign policy decision making. That this isn't a gift somehow for someone to give the State Department. It's an effort to change the way the department does business. And I will say that there's a lot of good news in all of this. Um, and so many of the recommendations from our first report um, have already been adopted. It. There's a lot of interest in looking at some of the blueprints that we have. The State Department itself has started to make some down payments. You know the number of people that have been hired. The budgets are increased. There's more diplomacy being done. And so those are all really good things. And then the fourth principle was the one I mentioned previously, is that we had great careers. We enjoyed ourselves. It was an honor to serve the United States of America. And so what we are doing here is to offer these blueprints to those who are serving today to help them do their jobs in a better way and also offer these blueprints to the people who will serve in the future. So people who have served, people who are serving, people who will serve. And so we started this originally, um, thinking about it in, 19, um, in 2019, uh, and we had a fantastic way forward, as you can imagine, and then COVID hit, just like it hit all of you, uh, and we had to change the way we did business. Um, but thanks to Harvard University, uh, at the end of 2020, we put out a report uh, sponsored by them and the Una Chapman Cox Foundation, which had 10 recommendations to change the way the State Department did business. And we listened carefully to the reaction to those 10 recommendations, and we talked to people, and we realized that there were four of them that we thought we could take forward. And so in 2021, 2022, we worked with Arizona State University now to produce these blueprints. And the blueprints are unique. And the reason they're unique is, is that each one of the four blueprints comes with all the legislation already drafted that's required to, pr to, to produce them. All the changes in law and regulation that would be required to produce them. In some cases, all the budgets that are required to implement these things. And so what we've tried to say to people is, if you'd like to do these things, here's how to do them. And we think that's different than some of the reports that have come in the past, which is just, here's an idea, you know, good luck to you. <laughs> um, and so we wanted to do, do, do something different um, than that. And so we thought that these 10 have shifted into the four blueprints and, um, and we're now, as Marco said, trying to get them implemented. And so I just wanted to ask Marcy for a minute to talk about the four um, so that you know what they're all about. Uh, and then we're glad to take any questions. Right. Thank you for that overview. And it really is terrific. And I just want to stress that the importance of diplomacy is just so key, as you stated. In fact, I work with... Um, um, a former Secretary of Defense, right. James Mattis, and, and he once testified, he said, if you're not going to invest in diplomacy, you're going to have to buy me a whole lot more ammunition. So um, with that, let right. me turn uh, to the four. That's but, a famous, yeah. that's a very famous quote. So I, we thought that it made sense to begin with the mission and the mandate of, of our diplomats. 
because it is it is the foundational element and also it's it's the seed of our moder modernization effort so one of the first things we did was to try to define um, pretty precisely what what are the major functions of our diplomats what exactly do they do what is their mission well one is advising the president on foreign policy the policy making process and the other is leading on implementing that policy abroad and without a well-defined mission and mandate that's understood and respected it re this, the service really can't function so we started from that point of view and our embassies as you all probably know are um, are multifunctional we don't have just the State Department abroad. Even our smallest embassies maybe have two or three departments uh, who work out there and, and work with their counterparts in that country. So we might have, let's say, the FBI or the Drug Enforcement Administration or even the Postal Service. In London, where I served, there were something like 25 agencies. And what we call this altogether is the country team. And uh, the, the head of the country team is, of course, the ambassador. And the ambassador gets his, his or her instructions from the president, and in, it comes in the form, actually, of a letter. There's a letter from the president of the United States to every single ambassador telling them their, what their mission is to be. So one of the, thing, one of the parts of our program for working on the mission and the mandate was to do a draft of that presidential letter, which you will find in the, in the blueprints. So the other thing that we looked at pretty closely was the policy process in Washington and how the State Department participates in that. So in addition to being the actors who carry out the policy are missions abroad are also the collectors of information about what is going on in the world and we expect them to be the best possible experts so we try to develop a way of ha of the State Department participating in the policy process where all of that information which they develop abroad it becomes um, put to its very best use so that's the first blueprint. The second has to do with education and training. Now, um, you, some of you may be um, vets and you know that in the, in the military, they plan for basically career long education. When you start somewhere in the middle, when you um, get to various uh, important points for promotion, there's built in a plan, a plan for education. We don't have that for our diplomats. So we started thinking about how that would look. And the idea was to give our foreign service officers and our civil servants the means to kind of up their game. We also wanted to give them the opportunity for more, more time for strategic thinking, uh, more for thinking about current, current issues and, and getting more deeply into them, an incentive for doing more language training, we have an absolutely wonderful school where we teach world languages to prepare people for living and working abroad, but we wanted to give people who had the ability and had the interest to, to do more. We, w we also looked at um, the idea of, of dividing up this training so that at key points in, in, our, in their careers, our diplomats would enter into a, a higher level of training and, that, and the whole piece would be something that would be open to everyone. So it's seen, so the other thing that we had to look at was culture. One of the problems with education and training is that you have to have people seeing it as a benefit. But too often it isn't seen as a benefit it's seen as a diversion from doing my real work right and uh and for our supervisors they they are faced with the problem of if if i send this person off to training then i'm i'm going to have somebody who's going to have to do double work so the other thing that we looked at was the idea of a training float mean what that means is that you have extra positions so when you're training people they are not 
they are not leaving behind an empty an empty position. And as Mark mentioned, the um, the State Department has already started making kind of a down payment on that. Uh, we think that it should be sort of a, an eight percent of the, of the um, overall body politic, if you like. And so uh, they've, put, they've already started up by about 4%. So there's another 4% to go. Other, so, other. So those first two are mission and mandate. Yes. And then the second one you say is the case for more professional education and training. The third is personnel. And um, there I will say that the idea is to modernize our personnel system in order to give uh, attention to the idea of uh, two career couples and how we, can, uh, how we can utilize that to everybody's best advantage. Mm -hmm. Also how we, would manage, how we would manage adding these extra people and uh, other, other ways of modernizing our personnel system. I, I'm in favor of that, by the way, because I was married to a U.S. ambassador and they didn't <laughs> let me do anything when I was right. there. So right. in any there case. you are. Yes. Yeah, all right. That makes all three of us actually. Yes. So. Yes. <laughs> so the last piece, uh, is um, the idea of a reserve corps that would be similar to the type of reserves that the military have. And why do we need that? Because we need a surge capacity. What we saw, for example, during the pandemic when we had um, the State Department moving tens of thousands of American citizens back to the United States or at least to safety. And we saw this in Afghanistan. And we see this every time there's a big flood or in Iraq, um, where I actually left my embassy to uh, go work in Iraq because we needed uh, a big team for the, the president's surge at that time. So um, we came up with the idea of a reserve corps. Um, it would be a much, much smaller thing than what the military have, but it would involve um, people who have regular jobs, but who have special skills or special language skills, and who could be called to serve where they're needed in the world, leave their jobs, and, um, and, and serve representing the United States. So that's our... That's the force. Well, that's great. And so uh, so a reserve corps, and you said that it's much smaller than a military reserve corps, but the entire diplomatic service is just minuscule when you compare it to our, oh, yes. our U.S. military. <laughs> right. I think someone once said that there are more members of military bands than there are members of the foreign service in the United States. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, but, but, but I think it's important just if I could just one second, because people here, you pay taxes, right? So... Your question is, all this, what's it going to cost? Right? So if you think about these four items, there are two big budget questions. Mm -hmm. Budget question number one is moving to the 8% for the training complement. And that number is, today's Foreign Service about 13,000 people altogether and another 10,000 people in the civil service. So if you take 8% and 4% is already done, we recommended 250 new positions per year, Foreign Service and Civil Service for four years, right? And the total for that's about $212 million. On the Diplomatic Reserve Corps, very similar. Our idea is to have 1,000 people in this Reserve Corps to bring them in at 250 a year, and that once this thing is going, it costs about $40 million a year to keep going. Mm -hmm. And so those are the numbers that are involved. Those are the two biggest budget expenditures in the blueprints. Right. So and in the, since a lot of this question in this blueprint that you're looking at is personnel oriented, and I know the answer to this because I've read through some of this, but, but could you address the questions of diversity and equity and inclusion and how, in many ways, you know, the State Department in the past has not been reflective of of our uh, of our population and and its demographics. Right. So, how are you looking to maybe um, move in that direction? Right. Well, um, the first is in recruitment. So, uh, one of our ideas was that we needed to look at recruitment so that we had. Right now, there's a really a modest program and general people come to us mm -hmm. uh, rather than reaching out. Uh, we do have people on, on uh, campuses, but not m maybe 20, 25 or so, I would say. So we don't really have a, a, a recruitment strategy that's 
that's pretty that encompasses the whole country. So that would be one way of get of getting geographic diversity was bringing more information to the American people and interesting more people in this profession. Another another way of doing it is is um, having an actual program, a diversity and inclu a program for diversity and inclusion and. And we now have an ambassador who uh, runs such a program. Uh, she was appointed some early in the new administration. Yeah, early in the new administration. And uh, what we're uh, looking at is um, both rewarding rewarding people for uh, managing their offices, their recruitment, their placement of people, their promotion of people in the proper, uh, diverse and an inclusive fashion. Uh, so that it becomes a part, it becomes sort of baked into our culture and to, in, to everything that we mm -hmm. do. I'd say, Marcos, also, just to go back to your first point, yeah. it, it needs to be said that there's a huge amount of work left to do yeah. at the State Department. So a lot of things have been done, but the numbers are really tough, right? And in some cases, the numbers are the same as they were 20 years ago in some cases. And so this has to be done, number one. Number two is that in the first report, um, one of the 10 recommendations was that there had to be a relentless focus, and that was the word we used uh, on diversity. And as Marcy said, one of the recommendations was that they appoint a chief diversity officer and that's now been done. Congratulations. And you can also see in the introduction that we put into this that that diversity and, and its ge geographic thought, all the ways to think about diversity, equity, and inclusion are kind of run through all four uh, of these blueprints. It's a really important subtext to the whole report. Yeah, and I think it's important. I mean, obviously the president has made it an important part of his overall policies. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's great that you're infusing this uh, in this particular field with with that uh, thinking as well. You know, um, when you talk about personnel and you talk about budgets, even though those numbers by rel in relative terms for, by congressional standards are really rounding errors, nonetheless, um, the diplomatic service, the foreign service doesn't seem to have natural constituencies in every congressional district. When you think about um, the defense industry, they have done a very good job of distributing their constituencies around the country and in almost every congressional district. Right. So how do you, I mean, maybe let me ask it this way. Do you see the e emergence of a constituency that is interested in these types of changes and plans, whether they're important for increasing budgets or just to sort of implement the sort of cultural, uh, thought, the, even the non-budget items? Yeah, I think so far, I have to say that one of the things we found is a very uh, positive response, uh, both in the public, and I hope you'll have one as well, and also on Capitol Hill. People are really interested in talking to us about these things. Um, and second thing I would say is, if you look back over the last few years, let's give the Congress some credit. I mean, a, a number of times, the State Department budget came from the administration cut way back, right? And it was the Congress that said, oh, no, 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 we're going to put money back into diplomacy, back into the State Department. And so I think there is a general sense that diplomacy is a very important part of what the United States does. Third thing I would say, and again, I hope you all will have a chance to at least take a short look at these blueprints. In every single one of them, one of the ideas is, is that the State Department has to do a better job of representing itself back to the American people. And and so Marcy talked about mission and mandate, the first of the blueprints. In it um, is a different way for people who come back from their overseas tour on home leave to, be, to, to come out and speak to the American public. I think one of the great advantages of the Diplomatic Reserve Corps would be what? Is that these people would then be ambassadors back to their home communities. So you might have a thousand or more people kind of going back to their home communities and saying, well, I served at the State Department. They do important work, right? Here's what they do. And so in each of the four blueprints, there is another theme like diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is better communication back from the State Department to the American public to try to create um, some of the support that we need. Right, and you both talked about the need essentially for a feedback loop in this process of diplomacy, where in fact the actors on the ground in uh, at their missions are taking uh, the mandate and the, and the uh, assignment from the president, but also returning in intelligence and information and, and analysis for policymaking purposes. What often seems uh, 
at least from uh, those who are in, in these various constituencies in the United States, is, the, is that there is no sort of feedback from the populace to the policymaking front, right? So that, so that uh, your average American citizen doesn't necessarily feel like they have uh, impact on policymaking in the foreign policy realm. Again, to sort of talk about the disconnect, because, and by the way, when I say disconnect, that's the word that Secretary Blinken used when he made his speech uh, about connecting foreign policy to the American people. People. So, so he recognizes that there is this disconnect between those of us who are citizens and those of you, although you're no longer actively in this field, making the policy and implementing the policy. Right. Um, how do you tie that in? And, or, and first of all, is there an ability for your average citizen to feed into the policy making, foreign policy making uh, field? And secondarily, how do we tie, how do you tie the American citizen, the average American citizen to our foreign policy? in real ways? Well, one way is as citizens, um, we vote. And uh, sometimes, not always, foreign policy issues can be an important part of an election cycle. And then you get different candidates talking about different policy issues. And then so the way you use your vote influences it. I, there's another way that American citizens have contact with, with diplomacy, and that is abroad when they need help. Uh, one of the most important functions of our diplomats abroad is helping out American citizens when they have problems, when they lost their passport, when they are ill, when, when they should unfortunately pass away. Then they turn to the embassy to help them out. And that's, that is a very central function of our embassies abroad. And that is a way that people have, have contact w with the State Department. Um, I think uh, it's, it's kind of an axiom of politics in our country that elections aren't won on foreign policy topics. But um, when it comes to a very important national issues, they do become part of the, of the dialogue. And that's, and that's one of the reasons why our, one of the values of our, de our, of our democracy, I would say. I'd also say it depends also about how you think about what's foreign policy, right? So here we are on the Pacific. Right, so you see, yeah, if you ask me, is the CHIPS Act a diplomatic, a diplomatic effort or is it a domestic effort? Well, it's obviously both, right? And so um, to the extent that diplomacy is now involved in, this whole, in the, all of the efforts in the Indo-Pacific to be here. Um, and, and, and if you talk about foreign policy and you say, no, no, there's the, the, the CHIPS Act, the questions of where your semiconductors come from, Right? Where they're produced, how they're produced, how they enter the United States. Those are diplomatic questions today. Um, you think about climate, right? And uh, you know, maybe there are lots of different views here about climate change, but you know, here's an enormous diplomatic problem. You know, getting the economies going again in the world. These are, these are diplomatic problems. And I think sometimes in the United States, we tend to kind of separate these things out. And we say, well, there's this big distinction between domestic politics and international politics. Less every day. Uh, and I think that's actually now being felt, I, you know, whether it's because of the globalization of information or the um, globalization of travel, whatever it is, I think I think that that has evolved and that there is this proximity to these issues. Citizen services at U.S. embassies is critical for anyone who's on a vacation uh, and uh, and either has their car broken into or <laughs> loses their passport or whatever those right. things are that that they, or, the, or the or the way embassies provide support to American businesses abroad. That's right, which is uh, maybe you can address this because in many ways, uh, a lot of that is is a commercial effort now, you know, to be able to, as you just said, domestically, we're talking about the CHIPS Act and how it's actually uh, a question of how we deal globally in a competitive environment. Right. But also on the other side, we're as the diplomatic service, you are promoting American uh, investment, you're promoting American trade and industry. So maybe you could talk, does that play into your um, blueprint in some way? Uh, yes, it does. Um, certainly in the education part, um, where we give a lot of thought to how we train people to assist American business uh, in both exporting from the United States and uh, and investing abroad, so that's a, that's a, that's a part of it. And um, you could 
you can imagine. I, 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 I once calculated as an ambassador sort of how much time I spent on commercial matters, and I'd say it was like about 40%, mm-hmm. uh, definitely. And helping out American business, having trade fairs, having uh, inviting local business people in to meet our business people, working with the local chambers of commerce. We do quite a lot of that, actually. And so when you say it's, you know, exports, it's, 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 and then it comes back to the creation of jobs in the United States. Yep. And you'll, you'll, you'll find that a theme as well, right? So what's this is all about? This is about strengthening the United States. And Marcy's right in, in the education section there. And then in the, in the draft letter from the president to ambassadors, there are a number of paragraphs that say you are responsible for supporting American business abroad because it creates American jobs at home. And, and I think that really is one of the main ways of tying American right. uh, citizens' understanding is if there sure. are jobs. Because all too often, I think if we think back historically, when we think about globalization and our engagement internationally, it has meant that it's been a, a job suck, right. that in fact we've been losing jobs in the international field. And I think that if you are in fact saying we have to raise the consciousness and change the reality of this, uh, of this commercial relationship that has existed in that has been in many ways a drain for the United States and to the benefit of, let's just say, the People's Republic of China. Um, how do you then make that shift? And I know that it's, uh, well, I'll let you answer it. Well, I mean, I, I, let's go back to the CHIPS Act for a second. Again, you, you may have your own view. I, I think the CHIPS Act was a very important policy choice of the United States of America. So if you think about that, so if you look at the State Department today, probably the number of people who are experts in semiconductors is probably pretty small. But one of the reasons we'd like to have a diplomatic reserve corps would be that let's say that you wanted to bring people into the State Department for a short period of time who really knew about this subject and could negotiate about it um, and help the transition to build up the United States capacities to do these things, you'd have the capacity to do it. And, and, and it's a diplomatic question again um, about you know the, the creation now of these big fabs right in New York and Texas, Arizona, People are going to get jobs in this business, uh, creating semiconductors here in the United States of America. And that's an important thing. And the State Department ought to have a, have a role in that. Um, and that takes a new way of thinking. Um, and so one of the advantages of a diplomatic reserve corps is while you might be training people over a longer term in data science or semiconductors or any of these new technologies, you could have them come to work tomorrow if you could draw on them from the reserve corps. Um, we're going to go to some of the questions, but uh, let me um, ask uh, something because you, um, Ambassador Grossman, you mentioned the nonpartisan nature mm-hmm. of this report and of the diplomacy overall. Um, this, what we I think all experienced uh, during um, the administration between 2016 and 2020 was that there was a real shift in the orientation of policy, and that and that some of the uh, changes. Um, were not consistent with previous policies, whether they be with NATO, where you both are very familiar, or other policies. But but when we think back now with some hindsight to the Trump administration, how did any of the, uh, during that period, w- what types of things may have helped or hindered movements towards reform of the types you're talking about? Well, there's a really specific one, um, which was early in the Trump administration. Um, they stopped hiring people for the Foreign Service. They said, well, we're not going to have any, no new Foreign Service officers. Um, and Secretary Pompeo, when he came to office, was one of the first things he changed. He said, no, we're actually going to hire Foreign Service officers again. And so that, 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 I, that had a big impact. Um, because you, as you can, you can imagine, if the United States military said, well, we're not going to take anybody any new for a couple of years, um, it doesn't work that way. And so similarly with us. So I, I think that was a, a both kind of both things happened simultaneously in that in, in the administration. You know, and to go back to Marcy's point, very important. You know, you talk about that administration making changes, Marcos. Well, elections matter. Right. And so um, there you have it. Right. He was the pre- President Trump was the president of the United States and he pursued certain policies. And, you know, some of them have have kept on to the Biden administration. Some of them have changed. But elections matter. Yeah, oh, and I, of course, um, part of the function of the of the Foreign Service is is to carry out the policy. 
which is made by the President of the United States. And that, that's the whole function of the presidential letter. This, this is what I want you to do in that country. So um, it's just, it's kind of a natural thing that when, when the, when the uh, party changes or the president changes, then we change with it. Do you find that it's hard for other countries to understand sometimes um, when we do make really big changes? I understand it. We understand it because we're yeah. the voters. We, we change our parties. We change our presidents. But when you're trying to, I, I imagine the big part of diplomacy is consistency of policies and commitments made. And, and it actually reflects some of the questions that I've mm -hmm. gotten here. Um, you know, how do you, as a diplomat on the ground or as an undersecretary, deal both with implementing that and reassuring those allies and friends that we've had about the consistency of the United States, the, this, the fact that we'll stick with them? Is, it's probably a challenge. It, it is a challenge, <laughs> yes. Well, I, um, I would say, actually, I'm glad you asked this question because um, I think too often people think diplomacy is something that anybody can do, mm -hmm. but it isn't. It's, um, it's something that you have to learn and you have to practice and you have to improve over a period of time. And a really good diplomat has a lot of experience and, and, and believe me, other countries spend a lot of time training their diplomats and giving them experience. Uh, sometimes they focus on a single region of the world and make them uh, real experts. So um, the, what, what we are asked to do is explain our policies in a way which is persuasive. At, at its most fundamental, diplomacy is the art of persuasion. So if our country has changed its policy on X, then my job as a diplomat is to explain to the foreign government why this is the most logical thing in the world, and beside that, it's in their interest. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, right? Uh, you are good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. That's it. Yeah, no, that's, and, I, and it really is. I mean, and I appreciate that answer, right? And, and, and you've really touched on things that are just key, which is how do you explain the world to people who don't have access? How do you explain the United States to those partners uh, when it can appear so difficult to understand? Well, and one other thing to keep in mind is all those countries have their diplomats in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. and they're quite sophisticated. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them keep their uh, <coughs> diplomats in place for many more years than we do. We have a different method of managing this. And so they, they become pretty, pretty knowledgeable <coughs> and pretty sophisticated about our culture yeah. and, and our politics. Although I have to feel a little bit sorry for them <laughs> because there's a lot going on in Washington at once and their missions are often way smaller than ours. Well, and you can see also, I mean, you have here in San Francisco, probably it's a remarkable diplomatic community you have here, right? Because people are interested in this part of the United States and what's going on in Silicon Valley and all these. So, you know, there's di the foreign diplomats are smart, right? Because they're in Chicago, they're in San Francisco because they know that the United States is, diff is a different country in different places. Um, so, you know, since we have <coughs> you both here and um, it's important to at least touch on the issues of the day, um, uh, you've already touched on China and our China policy and chips and the wow. American approach. Um, but um, China recently was with, uh, or at least the leader of China, Xi Jinping, was recently with the head of Russia, Vladimir Putin. And um, and there's a war in Ukraine going on. So contextualize all of that for <laughs> us in, in no time whatsoever and why it's important. Um, or what is it that should, we should be looking at as the world shifts right now with all of these things that are sometimes indecipherable? Um, and, and it seems to all be playing into one big business. <coughs> If you talk about China, then you can look at what just recently happened with them brokering a deal between Iran and Saudi Arabia. The meeting in China with uh, if Xi Jinping in, in Russia and a war in Ukraine. And I, I mention all of those at once because it is all interrelated, right. even though uh, in diplomacy you often have one country or one region that you're covering. This really seems to be a, a moment of great geopolitical shifts. 
One of the very first things I said in my opening was, there's a competition going on all around the world. And that's the truth. And this competition is as you describe it. It isn't about one region, it isn't about one country. There's a competition going on about whose way of life and whose way of thinking and whose rules are, are going to shape the future. And that's the question that's before really everybody in the world, certainly before Americans. And so all of the things that you talk about are subsets of that competition. Marcos. And so one of the reasons that we have been so interested in the diplomacy of this is, is how do you compete? And you can see how you compete militarily. You compete militarily by spending, research, having the greatest military in the world, all of those things that, you know, are really important to the United States. But, you know, to go back to General Mattis's quote, you know, that isn't the only way that you compete in this world. The other way that you compete in this world by having, as we've called for, the best possible diplomatic service for America. And that's what Americans expect and that's what Americans deserve. And so if you think about this competition that's out there and then all of the pieces that you defined are part of that competition and being able to compete diplomatically is going to be one of the ways that America will come out uh, successfully uh, from this challenge. Great. So let me go to the uh, questions from the audience and they've put together um, these uh, question cards here. And uh, the first one is really following up on this Russia question. And by the way, uh, we're very lucky here in the Bay Area. We have a former Russia um, ambassador to the Russia, um, Michael McFall, sure. who's yeah, one of my sure. colleagues at Stanford University. Right. And we also uh, are aware that the head of the CIA currently is also a former ambassador yes. Yes. to Russia. Uh, and so uh, the question from the audience is, how well equipped are today's diplomats to deal with the challenge the U.S. faces dealing with Russia? Is there a large contingent in the Moscow embassy and what are they able to do? <laughs> hmm. Well, there was a large contingent in the Moscow embassy, but it's now um, much, much smaller um, due to the back and forth uh, between us and the Russians about our respective, uh, our respective embassies. And uh, the R Russians have uh, forced quite a number of our diplomats to leave. And so now we have a, a but it has always been a, a pretty robust embassy. And, um, and definitely the State Department encourages people to take Russian, to serve there, and uh, to learn about uh, r our our overall relationship and and there are I think there's really a lot of interest in this growing relationship between the Chinese and the Russians and of course there's the war in the Ukraine so America's attention is drawn now um, to Russia and to what is happening there in a lot more detail than we did before um, but um, I think this is such an evolving uh, situation it's really um, it, it, it's uh, it's a good thing that we have we have a pretty big cadre of people who are who are pretty well versed in this in this part of the world and I think it's important just to follow on what Marcy said that you keep that cadre um, you keep these people kind of focused on these questions because you don't know what will happen, right? But at some stage or another, you have to figure out how to live with Russia, live with China. And so you can't just wake up one morning and say, oh, we're going to change our policy. And then, as we talked about before, you don't have any way to implement it. Right? And so that's the piece of this that says, look forward, do the professional education that's required, and be ready for all the for contingencies. How do things change uh, during a hot war, uh, which is what we're experiencing? If you are a diplomat in country and the country that you're in effectively is uh, pursuing uh, military kinetic actions and uh, uh, contrary to the interests of your country. How do you how do you what is your day to day? What do you what do you do in the in that embassy to try and deal with these very issues, and I speak specifically to being in Moscow when uh, Vladimir Putin is conducting this war next door. Yeah, I, I, I let Marcia knows lots more about the Moscow piece of this, but I, if you'd allow me, 
Let's give a little thought to the people who represent us in Ukraine. Yeah. Right. So um, our ambassador there, Bridget Brink, yes. is a foreign service officer. I think a woman of great courage. Uh, the people who are there with her are people of great courage. And I can't imagine actually what their life is like most days. I mean, you know, we both have served in war zones, but this is every single day of these attacks and being surrounded by this. And I think, you know, sometimes uh, one of the reasons maybe um, that, that people kind of think about foreign policy is this kind of, I don't know, I can't understand it, um, is, is that you got to stop every once in a while and recognize that foreign policy is about human beings, right? And so you can talk about the great strategy of Ukraine and Russia, China, this, that, and the other thing, but you got to stop and think about the death and the destruction and the human misery that is in Ukraine. And we have people there who are representing us today. They're going to be there tomorrow. And I give them an enormous amount of credit. So God bless the people in Russia. Please don't get me wrong. But let's stop for a second and recognize that we've got people in Ukraine and they're doing a fantastic job. Surrounded by misery and, and, and a war that is being conducted all really? around them. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. And, and I think it really is something that we need to remember is that any service is made up of people, whether it's military service or diplomatic service. And these are. They, and, the, and the impact of policy is on people. Yes. Right. So so that's a, it's a really important thing is, is that diplomacy is not some theory. Diplomacy has impact on human beings. And that's why it's such an interesting profession to be in. That's uh, it's great. Uh, and because oftentimes when you're watching the news, you're not seeing the impact on people necessarily. You're hearing about ships being sunk or, or UAVs, drones flying over something. And and the human aspect of this is often lost. Um, OK, let me move on to it looks like uh, we have a couple of questions here on the Middle East. Um, so um, Iran is the question and and it'll be it's a, a it, the question is iran is currently experiencing a revolution maybe that's not the case but in another case because of the death of a woman uh, what is the usa position of support uh, or not to get involved and, and the question here is about a woman who removed her hijab and was uh, taken in and, and um, beaten and then left uh, dead and there have been a number of demonstrations in the street of women also taking off their hijab but also having allies and men and that this is not just in tehran but around the country right. so how is the u.s approaching this uh internal problem in <laughs> the um islamic republic uh, well, um, this was uh, uh, this was a tragedy, the death of this of this woman, this uh, young woman, and of course, I think. Um, well, I think my personal view is that I mean, the I think that we are watching this cautiously, you might say, because uh, on the one hand, um, the United States has a lot of difficulties in its relationship with Iran and um, with the activities of this, of this Iranian government. Uh, and, uh, and, and in that, in that atmosphere of sanctions and this long period of bad relations ever since the revolution in, in Iran, um, we have uh, a rather, di you might say, distant r relationship with the Iranians, uh, and we have uh, we have tried to talk to them, but it sort of to no avail. And um, I think this um, this particular this incident and the um, and the activities of the Iranian people in, in opposing their government is something that. I think we're watching with interest and we're talking about, but you really, this is really something for the Iranian people and we have to see, you know, where they're going, where they're going to take this. It's a, you know, this is a, this is a, a big national, a big important moment for them nationally. Um, we'll have to see where this goes. And, you know, there's also the matter of the, um, of the nuclear agreement which we reached, but then the next president took us out of, and where the current administration has said, okay, well, we're going to, ne we're going to negotiate an even better agreement. So um, we're sort of, we're, uh, we're sort of there, 
um, with this uh, with this pending, but the issue, the question of um, the Iranians becoming a nuclear weapons state is um, is a, is a very frightening thought. So we really um, that's that's a really important issue that needs to that continues to to take a lot of attention. So there are some things there. Are, I, relationships between countries can be quite complicated where you can have a lot of hostility, but you're going to still try and work on the diplomatic track to achieve something that's very important to you. And, and in diplomacy, you're looking for leverage to be able to also, not just to explain to another nation who we are and, and what we would like to see, uh, directions that we would like to see them uh, heading, but you also are looking for points of leverage where you can actually help move them right. in those directions. Mm -hmm. uh, effectively, there is no leverage other than the sanctioning uh, regime that we currently have on Iran and whatever it is we can't see uh, that, is, uh, that is perhaps acting on this. But, but it's tough for American diplomacy to have an impact on Iranian domestic politics. Well, it's also very hard, of course, here domestically, right? So I think Marcy's exactly right. The administra this administration came saying, well, we're going to try to negotiate a better nuclear deal. Right? But, uh, you know, from my perspective anyway, in terms of leverage, the Iranians have made this impossible. Yeah. Right? If they've made it impossible to have this conversation now. And some, some more things are going to have to change, I think, on their side to get this going again. So the next question also uh, deals uh, with that region, but also brings in China. And the question is, how can U.S. diplomacy counter and partner with states brokering peace, specifically looking at China facilitating a deal between Iran and Saudi Arabia earlier this month? So for me, I mean, you may disagree. Um, I, 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 as I said, there's this competition going on worldwide. In this specific case, you know, the fact that the Chinese were able to broker a, a deal between, you know, Iran and Saudi Arabia, that's good, right? I, 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 I wouldn't undo it, right, because they did it. Um, the question is what message it sends to the United States of America. And so uh, I, I think if the Chinese can do this, it's good for the United States that Saudi Arabia and Iran are not kind of at daggers drawn with each other. Um, but we, t we should take the lesson from it that we can do more things than one thing at a time. And so the United States needs to continue to be interested in the Middle East. That's true with our ally Israel. It's true with all of our other interests in the Middle East and our allies and friends interest in the Middle East. And so good for the Chinese, but let's not let that be the end of the story. Um, so a question uh, that's uh, going really specifically to your blueprint and uh, someone here recognizes that the Foreign Service can be very heavy on personal life and family. Hmm. And uh, are there any supportive measures for the families following the diplomat to foreign postings? Well, thank you for that question. Yeah. <laughs> ah, there you are. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, there are. Uh, um, in our blueprints, we address the question of employment of uh, spouses and partners, but uh, we do have a very uh, active, lively um, support programs for families, for children. We provide uh, information before going to post and uh, all kinds of activities when people get their assistance and putting children in school and getting settled. People have uh, sponsorships. There used to be, there I used to be when I was in London, there were, um, there was a lunch group of male partners. Um, we call them trailing spouses. It was a rather old fashioned uh, term for it. Uh, but there is, um, and, and actually um, it can be the envy of, um, uh, bu the business community because we uh, we do provide a lot for our diplomats in the way of support for the families and and uh, and activities around holidays and so on and and particularly in our harder posts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. But yes, um, in the in the personnel one, as Marcy said, there's a there's a lot of focus on kind of employment, uh, retention, 
uh, making it easier and better for families to help represent the United States abroad. And also in the mission mandate one, we were talking before about uh, this idea to have more diplomats go out into the American public and speak. One of the things we put in the mission and mandate uh, was to provide money so that spouses and children could go with them because they play an enormously important role in representing the United States. And so if they were at an event like this, I think it'd be really interesting for you to hear what their life is like and how they represent the United States. And so there's a small amount of money in that blueprint so that whole families could come and participate in, 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 in events like this. Great. The, the flip side and the hard thing is we have a lot of people who are serving without their families. Yeah. Right. And um, this has eased a little bit now that we don't have conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq where we're people who are unaccompanied. And um, we provide support for those people um, whose families are not with them, all kinds of things. But still, that's, that's difficult. Yeah. Difficult service. Um, so this one also speaks to personnel and, and people who are uh, at post. And um, the question is, how do you diplomatically handle issues when the country you are in knows um, that uh, those who are there do not approve of their culture, such as uh, educating women? Where So someone who's at post in a nation where, in fact, the woman is, is not uh, allowed to have an education. Well, among other things, we write a human rights report on every country in the world. Actually, we write one on the United States, too. And uh, those reports are published, and they don't usually mince words. Uh, so I think um, countries know very well what kinds of practices we consider to be um, contravening our idea of good human rights performance. And of course, it's not just when the, when the report is published. Those, um, those reports follow usually dialogue um, all year round about, the, about various human rights issues. So it really is a part of our diplomacy, I would say almost everywhere, is um, discussion of human rights issues, particularly if there are problems. And of course, that can be hard. Those, that's where um, you really need an experienced diplomat, is to be able to discuss with, with government counterparts um, negative aspects, things which the U.S. Um, has problems with. Those are, those are hard discussions, and, and handling those properly is really, is really the realm of, that's where we get to really serious diplomacy. Mm. And those issues carry on. I mean, there are nations that have human rights challenges, of course. Um, for those of us in San Francisco, we think about LGBTQ uh, issues in many in many countries. Those are reversing those those policies. Um, and so um, being able to both do it, I think you're suggesting the blueprint, which is raise our education level and our opportunities within our diplomatic service, but also have those experienced diplomats on the ground who can broach these topics and do so diplomatically and not blow up a relationship with the nation, uh, I think is, is really important. Well, I think if, if Americans, if the American public expects to have the best possible diplomatic corps and the best possible diplomatic representation of the United States, they also expect that part of that representation be of our values. And I think that's important. Um, I'm going to ask one more question here. No, I've got two questions before I... Uh, so, since we are in California, um, could you talk a little bit about uh, the Pacific orientation of our foreign policy and the transatlantic orientation of our policy and how, <laughs> how to bridge those? Since we, we actually are on... We can see the Pacific Ocean. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Well, there's no doubt that um, right now there's a lot of emphasis on the Pacific, um, on the Pacific aspects of our, of our policy. And here's, you know, uh, here's where the this is where today is. There's really a lot of emphasis on diplomacy because alliances, the care and feeding of alliances, is very much a part of the diplomatic realm. And, uh, and here in the Pacific, that's one of the things that we're very actively doing now, is working with our allies and friends uh, 
in uh, in the Pacific Basin. So, so that's a that's a really important part of our diplomatic activity. So there's this AUKUS arrangement, and uh, there's the Quad, and uh, quite a lot of at new activity going right now. So it's um, it's actually a heavy diplomatic season, I would say. Well, in November, we are expecting the APEC summer, uh -huh. the summit to mm -hmm. come here to San Francisco. What should this city prepare for? I don't think we've had a summit. We recently had a summit in Los Angeles, which was the Summit of the Americas. Right. Uh, but San Francisco hasn't hosted one. I, boy, I don't know if it's been since the United Nations Charter being signed, but, um, but it certainly has been a long time. What should we expect in San Francisco uh, with such a big summit of 21 uh, foreign leaders arriving in this city? A big Aside from traffic bad traffic. Yeah. <laughs> bad traffic. Bad <laughs> traffic. Problem. <Yeah. laughs> Well, I, again, just to follow to follow what Marcy said. So I, I, I'm a native Californian. I was born in Los Angeles and graduated from UC Santa Barbara. Right. So I, I've got the Pacific piece of this. Um, it, it's certainly in my background, e even though I was the Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs. So you'll have to forgive me for that. Um, but it seems to me that what you will expect is. Um, a, an enormous diplomatic focus on all the things that Marcy said. I mean, in a way, again, you all study this, but in a way, kind of, if if if, if you if the United States is pursuing a set of grand strategies, but the grand strategy the United States is pursuing today is the Indo-Pacific strategy, and so what you will see in San Francisco is the living, breathing kind of outcome of that strategy, and and you'll see it as she said with AUKUS, with Quad, with all the work. We're doing with Japan, with India, um, and so um, it, it'll be it'll be a chance for people here uh, to get a chance for themselves to judge kind of how that diplomacy is going and how the military piece of it is going as well. Because you don't want to forget that very important part of the Indo-Pacific strategy. So now it's time for the last question from the audience, and uh, it again speaks to the blueprint. And um, what are the what are some consequences if we fail to make these reforms? And why now? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's start at the back, the why now. OK, so I, the last time we had a big overhaul or, or a big modernization of our diplomacy was actually in 1980 when we passed the Foreign Service Act. So a lot has changed in the years since 1980. And there's, and there's more of a focus on diplomatic solutions these days. I mean, we, we have Americans talking about the forever wars and so on. So, and we also have a lot happening in the area of technology and um, things like um, cyber and AI and these issues. People are wondering, you know, how are we going to handle these things internationally? And we have new frontiers. We have the Arctic. We have space. So how are we going to regulate things and people's activities in those places? And all of these fall, all of these things fall in the diplomatic realm. So that's the answer to the why now piece of it. I'd say the consequence of not doing these things is, is that we don't compete at the level that we'd like to compete. I mean, if you don't do any of these things, great people will still be American diplomats. Our diplomacy will be very good and, and, and courageous and, 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 and well executed. But what we're trying to do is sort of take it up a notch right? and say, if the competition has increased, then let's have the capacity and expertise of our diplomats increase. And I would bet, right, if you took a vote among our diplomats today, that's where they'd like to be as well. So I want to thank both Ambassador Reese and Ambassador Grossman for an engaging uh, talk this evening and for all the hard work that you've done to put together that very thick volume of ideas and blueprints that we hope to see implemented as, uh, and, and thank you for all the work and for your service over the many years. Well, thank you for thank having you. us and thank you for your interest. Thank you yeah. for coming. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.